This is the Real Coaching Podcast. This is Joel Filiol, and we're back for episode two with Paulo Souza. Hi, Joel. How are you? So we just released the first episode um, a couple of days ago. We had a comment uh, that we're not on iTunes yet, so I've submitted the podcast to iTunes. I think I think uh, I think uh, Uli Uli, uh, a renowned uh, anti-doping. Uh, fighter and also a very grumpy person on Twitter made that comment, right? That That's right. And uh, so thank you, uh, Uli. And we also saw that uh, he uh, he had a post today on uh, how he, he's busted uh, the winner, I think, of his, his home Grand Fondo New York. Uh, and with, with a re- uh, so so well, well done there. Uh, if For those that don't know, uh, Uli is a, a vocal crusader fighting the good fight and uh, p- pays for his own uh, testing at his events. He runs the Grand Fondo New York, which is actually a worldwide series now. Mm-hmm. So well done. To yeah, you. great, great job. I I think that uh, I think that if every race director had the same um, the same commitment to to anti doping as uh, Uli does, uh, both in cycling and uh, and also in our sport triathlon, then uh, yeah, the, the the sport would be would be in a better place for sure. Indeed. So, the, if if anyone wants to to subscribe by RSS, the the link is on the podcast page now. Um, that's a direct uh, subscription, uh, but it should be on iTunes soon. And uh, I think we had a, a number of um, feedback items, so we're going to get into a few of those uh, uh, today before going into the main topic of of high performance. What is high performance? Um, mm-hmm. So we want to encourage uh, uh, feedback. We had a lot of good questions, ma- mainly from from one character called Five Sticker Rides. I think his name is Ross. But also, if anyone wants to prefers email, they, uh, set up an email address. It's just simply podcast at joelfilial dot com, and we'll put that uh, in the show notes as well. So uh, the feedback, uh, the, the, there was a few questions from from at Five Sticker Rides on Twitter. Um, uh, about obviously as a follower of, of of WTS racing and 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 pro racing in general, which uh, I think we're both big supporters of. Uh, in mm-hmm. fact, um, if you want to uh, participate in this, uh, fantasytriathlon dot com, which is a domain uh, I used to own for a long time, but I, I donated that to um, to uh, TRS Triathlon, and 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 they've taken their um, their fantasy game and and put it under the under that domain. But uh, I think we enc- encourage uh, people going to play that that sort of stuff and just following following triathlon and following elite racing. So, mm-hmm. so the questions were um, uh, the first question: Why a domestique in two thousand eight? So he's referring to um, the Canadian team in Beijing. Uh, I was head coach at that point and coaching uh, Simon, uh, Colin, and uh, Paul Tischler. Uh, so the the answer to the question, I suppose, from my point of view, is was insurance. Uh, Simon had proven that he could win races, he could be at on the podium, and uh, we we felt going that road would uh, would would increase his chances of of, of uh, podium performance in in uh, in, in the race in Be- in the Beijing Olympics. Um, as it turns out, the, the 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 race dynamic perhaps didn't didn't demand that. It wasn't um, absolutely um, you know necessary. It didn't make the race, but but I th- you know when I'm thinking about this and reflecting back, I think the Colin uh, Jenkins being involved in the process, supporting Simon both his training and through the races, the 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 the, the insurance, if you like, I think I think did make a difference. Um, so that's that was. Uh, that that's my view on it. I mean, the the other components of that to the same same question. Uh, um, Five sticker ride says I'm I'm not Canadian, but I followed the story. I was thir- thoroughly behind uh, Tish and Beijing, and felt pretty bad for uh, Jones and McMahon. I think uh, it's important to say that that Paul Tischler was racing for himself in Beijing. He uh, didn't make the selection criteria. Uh, was selected to support Simon. He. Uh, was not happy about that. Kicked off. Eventually became quite a big distraction for the team, and he was released from that role uh, more than a month out. And, and he prepared how he wanted, and he got the, the performance that um, he did, which I don't remember what place it was. 
Do you have? Yeah, a... I, don't, I don't remember either. Yeah. Uh, so. Well, my my only my only comment here is that uh, it's uh, I I observed from the outside the the whole 2008 and uh, question with the uh, with the selection of uh, Colin for to uh, help out Simon and uh, it was uh, it was uh, fun to watch from the outside. I, I bet it was a little painful to leave it on the inside but uh but uh it was a situation where um, a domestic made made a lot of sense because simon was uh was a proven performer and he ended up performing on on the day uh i see sometimes some uh some uh, domestic situations where uh the domestic is there to uh, a little bit of like a wishful uh wishful thinking of every if everything goes well and this guy has the help of the domestic, then maybe things will happen, and uh, and uh, and obviously it's easy to justify when you're supporting a top performer, but it's very hard to justify when when you are uh, supporting a performer that's at the level of other other athletes in the same nation, and it's very hard to understand why one guy will have a domestic, but everyone else won't have a domestic. So so. Uh, so that the situation, I think, even if most people don't understand how a domestic might be there, uh, I, I I think it makes sense in a situation where where there's it's like if this guy is in the front pack and in good shape coming out of the bike, he's going to win the race. He's going to podium. Yeah, and I might you know, and uh, th- this has evolved since then. I mean, uh, domestiques had probably been used before then, but 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 to do it at at Olympic Games and and actually New Zealand did did this also at the at the Beijing Olympics and on the men's side. But it's it's evolved mm-hmm. quite a lot since then, and uh, you know that that's perhaps what what we're seeing now. Um, you know, certainly there was some. Uh, interest and sort of noise in in Edmonton last year at the grand final when um, Gwen had uh, Sarah Haskins racing for her. Uh, that mm-hmm. that was a uh, you know there's quite a lot uh, behind the scenes that was going on there. But but that but that was that was been in the case uh, case. And in fact, USAT has been been really on the bandwagon uh, with uh, with domestiques in many different areas. And and uh-huh. as as you pointed out. Um, Polo. I mean, we're seeing this at all levels, really, and often in cases it's really not appropriate. I mean, even at the mm-hmm. junior level, you know, uh, my opinion is yeah, that yeah. Ath- athletes... Edmonton, at, <laughs> Go ahead. In Edmonton last year, there were some uh, so domestics racing uh, in the junior race as well, yeah. Yeah, and we and we saw this, you know, uh, this year in, in Chicago as well. And, of course, it, you know, it, it begs the question, you know, uh, what are we preparing athletes to do? And I think it become a, can become a crutch, and I think we, we've seen a lot of that as athletes really need to learn how to win on their own. And really, they, you know, what we see is the most successful athletes are complete athletes. They can swim, they can bike, they can run. And if you're employing these sorts of strategies at early ages, early development levels, or I think really, as you point out, for athletes that aren't pro- haven't proven they can win, then you've got to question the strategy and, and really what, what the sport is about and what, what are we trying to do? Because I think we can become a little more... A little too clever, and, and and I think it's been it's backfired in a lot of cases. I've seen cases of promising young athletes being put in a domestic role when they really should be racing for themselves for their own development. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and, and and you know, fundamentally, it's you know, where is the sport going? And and uh, you know, one of, one of the questions from Five Sticker Rides was, uh, what about the Brownleys uh, employing quote unquote uh, Varga? How do you sit with that? And uh, for those that don't know, the Varga now lives in trains in Leeds uh, with with the Brownleys. When when I was involved in in British triathlon, he was coming out to some camps. Um, we'd we'd find a bed or a sofa or something for him somewhere. He wasn't paid at the time, as far as I was aware. I don't know what the situation is now, but I see it as something that's mutually beneficial uh, for for him. He gets a great training environment. Uh, being from from Slovakia, he doesn't really have a, a a big structure behind him, so he gets a great training environment. He he uh, has the same strategy. He, he, they they want to get away from the better runners and uh, and uh, create you know create a separation in the race, and and that's something that uh, is certainly beneficial to him. And and the Brownleys want that to the effect. Does he sacrifice his races uh, at times? 
I don't know. It, it, that's an interesting question. What do you, what do you see, Paulo? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I think that uh, the the fact that he's, he's racing for another nation, uh, but training with uh, with uh, with the with the British, uh, it's it's interesting. I think that's that's the way. I think the way sport is going is that uh, uh, national uh, barriers are uh, more and more not making a lot of sense. You have uh, you have Kenyans racing for Qatar in track and field. Uh, I was reading a piece the, uh, yesterday about how uh, two Americans are uh, two American g gymnasts are, uh, are competing at uh, Worlds for uh, Belarus, and uh, and uh, and when when they give out interviews saying like, no, I'm an American, I'm still an American, I'll continue to be an American, and and uh, so I think that those lines are 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 becoming more and more. Uh, Tenuous and uh, and uh, situations like this uh, are going to are going to uh, happen and um, you know I'm fine I'm fine with I'm fine with uh, I'm fine with with these situations uh, I I think that they bring some different uh, tactical considerations to the sport and uh, and make it more interesting. Indeed, I mean, I think if if people look back at at the London Olympics with a critical eye and look who is doing work on the front of the packs, both in the men's and women's races, you might see athletes there that that don't appear to have any interest, of, uh, self interest of, of of riding like they did, uh, but mm -hmm. but impacted the race. So there's potentially some deals that were going on there. Uh, certainly, you know, the, the, this uh, hit, hits home uh, f uh, for me and in, in my work with uh, with Rich and, and Mario and, and others where, you know, uh, the more that this is happening in the front of the race, the harder it, it makes our work. Um, it, it's interesting coming from from the Brownleys, this sort of strategy, because they're they're very much uh, we want real triathlon. We want hard courses. Uh, you know, we want uh, we want the best man uh, to win. Uh, However, the, the question that this strategy raises is, it, are the best athletes winning? And uh, I, I think we can, we can make a case that, yes, they are. However, mm -hmm. you know, continue along um, to, uh, you know, to where we're cycling a uh, long history of this. And, and occasionally the strongest athlete doesn't win uh, due to tactics. So, uh, you know, it, it raises an interesting question at the least. Yeah, I would say, I would say that the evolution of... of of the team aspect of triathlon has been very, very slow. So you remember that when, when IT racing went, you know, full, uh, draft legal, uh, the, 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 the people that were against it were like, Oh, this is going to turn, uh, this is going to turn, uh, triathlon completely into, uh, into a team sport. Uh, and, and triathlon is pretty far from being a completely a, a, a team sport. And, uh, and, uh, in the future, I don't see it turning into a team sport either because the athletes themselves, they're very strong individuals and, and the culture in the sport is not a team culture like in cycling. So basically, uh, nobody out there wants to, to, uh, no, nobody out there wants to, to work for, for each other. You know, nobody out there is thinking like, I am going to be a really good domestic, uh, everybody, even those that, uh, even those that are uh, or have been in, in in domestic roles, they wanna they wanna race for themselves. I you know in my squad, I have a, a good example with uh, Eric Lagerstrom, who's done the job of domestic for uh, yeah, a few races. But obviously, Eric wants to be his own athlete, and uh, and uh, and he and he's done just that. You know, he's he's he's, he's had some really good results and at not being a domestic. So so I don't see I don't see our sport turning into a team sport just because the individuals and and it's so such a such a selfish uh, pursuit to be a triathlete that uh, that uh, the people that are the athletes that are coming through are very strong individuals and uh, and they don't have a team approach to the sport at all yeah I agree I mean the the process has been has been slow and 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 they're, the way that it's set up it, the, they're just barriers to to becoming a complete team sport from the both the funding to the prize money uh, mm -hmm. et cetera i mean there's there's one um organization that's got this tagline sharing the win 
which, uh, you know, it really falls down in situations like this. I think it falls down generally, but also in situations like this where 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 the, the model just isn't isn't there. I mean, uh, uh, from from government funding to national funding, uh, I mean, when we're talking on the IT side to to even prize money, uh, it, it's it's mm -hmm. complex. So, you know, back back to um, five sticker rides comments, uh, you know, um, I would just I'll just interrupt you like what what organization has uh, sharing the win as their motto I, I I just can't can't place it right now yeah me, me neither uh, okay it's, okay. it's so a, let's, let's move on yeah, we'll let's move, move on. forward yeah. so uh, so the one one comment that just just briefly uh, further on this is Shepley is not clear this is what five five uh, sticker rides is saying is referring to the IT commentator. Uh, Barry Shepley. Uh, of course, Barry doesn't always know what what what's uh, you know what's been agreed and and what the what the the deal is, um, you know. Uh, but but the, the the further comment along those lines uh, was, um, can you throw anyone under the bus regarding the Wiltshire Gomez affair? And uh, I will put a, a link to this YouTube video, which I assume is still on YouTube. Of um, he's referring to. Uh, it was European Championships. It was in Pontevedra, I think. It was in uh -huh. uh, Gomez's hometown, and uh, and and this video shows uh, Harry Wiltshire, a British athlete and quite quite known to be quite a good swimmer, uh, swimming next to Gomez in in a way that really looks like he he's impeding him. He's he's purposely trying to slow him down or or certainly yeah, mark it's very him. Obvious. Yeah. So, um, can I throw anyone under the bus? First of all, Harry contacted me to. To try to uh, this after this happened to try to uh, uh, testify, I suppose for him. Uh, but when I watched the video, I, I really couldn't get involved. I mean, it's quite obvious. Um, I think it's it's worth saying, you know, from you know from a team perspective. Again, when I was with uh, British Triathlon as well, uh, we would have uh, particularly for European Championships or smaller races, employ strategies where we'd have. Uh, you know somebody who is uh, who is a domestique who is de identified to that. I can recall Phil Graves doing that at the European mm -hmm. Champs in, in Ireland, etc. So th these are these are team plans. Um, mm -hmm. Now I, I have to say I wasn't involved when uh, when this was going on. I think it was 2011. Uh, so I, I was out by then. So I really don't have any insider information. I can only uh, give a bit of context, uh, which I have. Um, but I, but I, I think it's clear that that um, the person that was thrown under the bus was was Harry Wiltshire. Uh, there was really not much comment. He he ended up with um, with a ban. I think it was a six month ban, um, yes. which he appealed and he and he fought. But there was really never any comment from from British Triathlon or um, or the leader of the team, which which was um, Alistair, uh, which I thought was was uh, very very poor form. Uh, that that. Um, that, uh, that there was no comment, that was, nobody stood up and said, oh, this was part of a strategy that, that went wrong, or um, yes, he was, he was supposed to mark Gomez but overdid it, or no, it was, it was all him. There, there was no comment. I have a hard time believing that uh, he just came up with this himself. Um, I have a hard time believing that uh, the strategy was to impede Gomez as much as he did. Um, however, I really, you know, I, I can only comment that that it was obvious, it was way over the line, and and we really don't want sport, uh, we don't want triathlon going that way. So, hopefully, uh, it doesn't happen in that way again. Um, you know, the, the the most obvious way. I mean, there's certainly the the swims are very physical. It'd be difficult to yeah. determine if this was happening on a more regular base. I mean, basis. I mean, the the guys. I mean, it's it's a it's a very very physical swim. So I, you know whether there's athletes marking others, but but we I think the my view is we really don't want to see this the sport go this way, and I thought it was very poorly handled by um, British Triathlon. I think uh, Alistair could have stood up and said something about it, but didn't. So I, I was disappointed in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I you know it's it's been it's been a, a quote unquote a long time ago, and uh, I'm I'm glad to see that. Uh, I'm glad to see that stuff like that hasn't happened since, and uh, and uh, and that's and that's great news. Uh, I would second the the physical swims. Uh, there's there's a lot of physicality going on going on in the in the swims. One, just as an example, one of my athletes uh, at at the Lanier World Cup got punched in the forehead and had the bump to to show. 
uh, and and this happened like at one of the buoys. So things get get very very rough there. Uh, I would definitely would like to see some some video some video that the officials could have of of um, of especially stuff that happens at the buoys and and I think that with a few uh, well placed uh, DQs, I think that the situation could uh, could go back to. Uh, could go back to being more and more civil because uh, sometimes uh, sometimes things get a little bit out of control, but not. I, I don't think not in a targeted way. It's just that when twenty guys want to be in the same place at at the same time around one of those buoys, things get uh, get a little out of hand. Yeah, that's, and it's worth saying that that at at pretty much every ITU briefing, th- this is one of the slides that goes up. Is they're they're, they're yep. mon- monitoring phys- physicality and, and violence, and and that there there will be video and review. Uh, however, I've yet to see an, any real action on this. Um, generally, if, if you know, I've had athletes that felt that it, uh, there was somebody that was over, overdoing it, and, and and it really never went anywhere. It's very it's very difficult to police. To be fair. But um, mm-hmm. but I agree that perhaps some well placed uh, DQs might uh, 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 set a set a point. Um, the other the other point mm-hmm. on this, of course, that part of the reason for the physicality is there, there's way too many athletes starting many races. Uh, I mean, some races it's just ridiculous. Uh, you know, seventy five athletes on the start line. I, th- I think it's just too many, and we're just uh-huh. asking for um, you know for these kind of physical swims that. But really, I think they aren't what anyone wants. Um, I understand why there's there's such big starts, uh, start, such fields. But, you know, they want as many flags on the start line as possible. However, yeah. you know, either the either the sports got to evolve and have longer um, to the first buoy, like you know, five hundred meters or or more, or they've got to mm-hmm. um, or they've got to have fewer athletes on the start line. And it's interesting, of course, because. Uh, the Olympic Games is 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 much fewer. It's only fifty five, which tends to be a slightly different dynamic. Yeah, uh, you know, I would love I would love to see, and you've you've heard uh, you've heard uh, Simon Wiesel talk about this before about uh, having more races like uh, like TZ with with semifinals and the final the next day. I think uh, I think that that would that would be a format where uh, where you would have like a final that would be a lot more competitive and and not a lot of people involved right now there's uh, there's a few races that are not more interesting just because the sheer amount of people uh in the race like racing and and when you have uh when you have a race where you know let's say just showing out the number like you have 75 people at 75 athletes at the start and uh, only 20 are there to, to that to be you know quote unquote competitive, but then the uh, the rest of those guys can can you know bridge up a, a breakaway no problem. Uh, they can they can impact the race in only negative way, but not in a positive way, and not making it more interesting. Uh, I think that if we had a, a process of like getting like smaller fields would make race, races a lot more interesting. And indeed, that's what the, the the World Cup circuit, as it's called now, uh, is for, and the and the Continental Cups uh, beneath that. So, uh, but moving along, we had a, one one other question that I think could be a topic for a whole uh, whole discussion, and and that's um, just a little bit about how the squads work. Um, question was, uh, we'd like to understand how how you guys make it work financially, uh, which is. Uh, you know, an interesting question. I mean, the 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 my my first comment is uh, you shouldn't work with um, elite athletes because uh, it doesn't really work very well financially unless you're employed by a federation uh, directly, and and that's the case for neither of us. Although mm-hmm. uh, some of us have got various levels of funding, both indirect and direct, uh, before that mm-hmm. can help. Yeah, uh, I would I would answer that question. How do you how do you guys work? make it work financially, I would say not very well. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's hard, uh, from, from my end, uh, from my end, a lot of the, a lot of, uh, it, it means I invest a lot in the athletes. Uh, I mainly, I mainly charge, uh, charge athletes for, uh, for a percentage of their prize money. And, and that means that throughout, you know, uh, 
throughout my life as a, as a, as an elite coach working with this uh, with this reward system obviously i'm still i'm still in the reds uh you invest in a lot of athletes that don't pan out you invest in a lot of athletes that even when they pan out uh you're not making a lot of money with them and and as you know for example if you if you have uh if you have someone that's that's a consistent for example top 20 performer at wts you're almost not making any money out of them and uh and um, so basically, basically the way it works out financially is by getting some funding the year or there with either coaching stipends or uh, or some percentage of prize money. And uh, and a lot of times, uh, you know, in in my last five years of being with the the squad thing is that uh, a lot of the times the coaching that I do, the online coaching, uh, is almost. Uh, you know the main sponsor that I have for uh, for for my activity as a coach. Uh, you know, just in interest of being fair, obviously uh, for 2013 and 2014, uh, I had uh, a squad grant from USA Triathlon, and that serves to uh, support the activity of uh, of my US athletes. But uh, but for uh, for this season 20, 2015. Uh, USAT uh, canceled uh, canceled my squad uh, grant, and uh, and that made our life a lot a lot harder, uh, you know, with some logistics and some stuff that was being paid by the that was being paid by the by the grant, and uh, and and that uh, and that uh, the athletes had to 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 support those costs, obviously. Uh, but uh, but you know, obviously, as you know, it's it's when you when you're involved with elite coaching is is a lot more or with elite real coaching uh it's a lot more about like the passion and the the drive to to achieve the goals that we have and less about um making money that's plainly how it is yeah ab- absolutely i mean uh, you know you raise a couple of interesting points there one of the is the stability of funding and how uh how fickle it can be. It com- comes and goes and seemingly with no rhyme or reason at times or these, these stipends that, uh, you know, uh, another, there was another comment about, you know, the, with the relevance of national federations with the rise of, of, of independent squads, like, like what we're doing and what Darren Smith is doing uh, and others, uh, you know, and, um, I have to say it's a great deal for uh, for many of these federations. I mean, they they pay either nothing, the athletes pay direct, or they pay uh, a stipend, uh, and the stipend is a fantastic deal uh, 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 compared to employing a full time coach. Um, however, you know, it, yep. it illustrates the relationship for us is really with the athletes. That's why we why we do it. Uh, you don't do it for, to, to to make money. I mean, even if you have. Uh, massively successful athletes and, and you you're on some sort of percentage uh, then um, you're uh, you're still you're not you're not uh, getting rich off that I mean if you have an athlete that's uh, making you know uh, in the six figures or more I mean uh, that's the standard percentages might be between five and twenty percent so do do the math it's, it's you know it's not much compared to a salary but but that's mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. as you say that that's uh, you know you add a few of those together, then uh, you you start to go into the black. But um, yeah, like the way that my model works um, is athletes pay uh, per month and a and a percentage, and uh, you know the 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 being away from home, the running the camps, the expenses are are significant. Um, so in the end, it's not tremendously profitable but i'm also feel really really fortunate to do it and to be able to do it and uh you know i wouldn't tell the athletes but i probably do it for free anyway yeah let's not tell the athletes that right so uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe a, a topic uh, we can go into uh further but i think we covered the main points but the the, the main uh, topic we had today as as we're we're th- almost 30 minutes in is um is, yeah. is high performance and what is high performance and I think this um, this was uh, initiated. There was a, there was an article that made it made a, the rounds uh, last week. Um, what are the real elements of of quote unquote high performance? And uh, mm-hmm. and it, right at the start of of the article, there was um, a, a point: it is uh, high performance the new fad word? And I think that that really uh, resonated with me, and I, I think it did with you as well. Yeah, 
absolutely yeah the, it's it's uh it's it's one of those things that uh that that it's turned into a a, a fad word and uh and uh and just to prove it let's let's remember that uh, accenture's uh slogan is uh high performance uh defined so so when uh, when when the term enters the enters you know the mainstream as the as the slogan for uh, the biggest consulting firm in the world you know that uh, you know it has uh, jumped the shark so to speak and uh and and to bring it bring it to 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 the business of coaching obviously uh, obviously uh just just bring it about kind of like it's oh this is high performance and uh and uh and obviously uh obviously uh it's 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 been used to to uh to name things that are not high performance at all and uh, i i i think that uh you know i i used it and i stopped using it uh, as much as i was before and uh, and just as an example i think that at some point, your Twitter bio said "high performance triathlon coach," and it doesn't anymore, right, Joel? No, because it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think that that you know the the, the article goes into um, you know various you know clubs and universities and schools that have high performance centers and that high performance programs and and. And it really, you know, the words cease to mean anything. And I mean, this this happens with a lot in um, in elite sport. I mean, everything stops meaning anything. Elite stops meaning anything. World class stops meaning anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and it comes back to, you know, words words are supposed to to mean things. And um, you know, when it comes yeah, to when, high- when you have when you have world class high performance, then it means even less. <laughs> Just it's a, a subtraction by addition. <laughs> Indeed. So. The, the article kind of, and I'll put a link in, in the show notes for this. Uh, it's worth a read. Uh, you know, it, it it maybe is a bit preaching to the choir of, uh, mm-hmm. of the mm-hmm. audience, but but I think it's worth uh, in, any coach, any uh, athlete, uh, worth reflecting. You know, are, are we behaving in consistent ways with what how we talk about ourselves? And you know, the first part is going into facilities. You know, and, and obviously having great facilities does not make your program a high performance program. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, one one thing, one thing. Obviously, one one thing about this this uh, this uh, this article that that I enjoyed is just like it's stuff that we we read before or we know, or uh, and and some of this stuff was I, I'm sure you remember those those blogs by Wayne Goldsmith, and those came out you know quite a few years ago, and some of these concepts are pretty much. Pretty much, you know, you read and you're like, yes, this is great. This is good. This, this is really good ideas. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, stuff. This is what we need to do. But, uh, but one thing, one thing that, that should be stressed is that uh, being, able to, being able to deliver high performance is not about, like, reading the good stuff and just getting excited. It's about, like, the day-to-day of getting stuff done, you know? Pretty much every coach can read this and say, like, yeah, this is great. This is amazing. This is what I want to do. But then comes, like, the buts. But I don't have money. But I don't have the infrastructures. But I don't have the people. And uh, and and that's where, you know, and that's where the relentlessness of doing it comes into comes into play, you know. And 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 that's a thing. That's a that's a factor that's not stressed well enough is that the more you just have to do it every day and that's what's going to bring you you know whatever you're looking for and and a lot of the times uh reading about stuff like oh people are the best people are people are uh the biggest resource or you have to have a philosophy or you have to have a good culture but it's it all starts with you what you want to do and what you're able to deliver on a daily basis and because reading reading stuff like this and i've read like you know dozens of these articles you come out of it and like super pumped like yeah this is great this is this guy just like hits it in the head but then just like it's the translation to the day-to-day and how to how to do it that uh, that is very very hard 
Indeed, I mean, I I, I like thinking back to uh, being based in Victoria and, and the the decision to swim out of Crystal Pool, the, the old pool, the old fifty meter pool in Victoria, rather than the fancy uh, uh, new uh, pool. And and at the time, we we kind of we 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 used that we enjoyed that we were like we we're in the the slow pool the hot pool the the pool in the downtown area with all sorts of interesting characters around and uh, it became something that we kind of rallied around but but it it never impeded our performance because we weren't in in the fancy pool and I, and i i think even um there's something to be said about you know athletes who show up and, and they have all of this you know quote unquote excellence around them and and all of the you know these amazing facilities and you know i i could make a case that perhaps it, it takes away a little bit of their motivation. They feel like they've arrived. Look, look how, mm -hmm. you know, look how high performance we are. You know, we've got everything. We've got all these toys and gadgets and, you know, all the latest devices. And, and, you know, we're so high performance actually that the day to day uh, perhaps doesn't matter as much. And, and not that it's black and white. Of course you can do both. However, I really think the psychology is something interesting. And, uh, and and these really expensive fancy facilities can be counterproductive. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's uh, there's a sense of uh, like for athletes, and if you if you have the infrastructures but you don't have the culture, uh, the tendency for athletes is to think that like I have arrived when they they can say like, well, I'm I'm an athlete at the Olympic training center, and uh, but. But the caveat here is that you don't have to be an Olympian to be to be a, at the Olympic training center, you know. So you don't have to, and and a lot of athletes just like get the feeling that just like I have arrived because I'm at the Olympic training center, and uh, and that's obviously not uh, not uh, not a great attitude you ju when you just think that you you've arrived. Obviously, like I was telling, like, well, I'm tired of I'm tired of reading blogs like this. Uh, also because like there's stuff in this blog that I still recommend that everybody reads that that's that are things that are obvious to me or stuff that I have figured out before and you have figured out before and pretty much every coach that uh, is able to deliver results consistently is as uh, as uh, figured out before you know stuff like like for example like like the culture and this this is the culture of the organization that you have. And this is something that we've discussed many times before on how, how do we build that culture? How do we, how do we keep that culture going? How do we tweak that culture in order to be better? And, and, and for me personally, that's something that's like really, really important is how can we, how can we take care of having the right culture? Indeed, I think uh, cu culture is another one where you start talking too much about culture and you're probably not doing good culture. Um, you know, I, I think <laughs> there's a, you know, when I hear um, certain words like winning, culture of winning, winning, you know, winning, winning, winning or medals, uh, immediately I think, uh oh, something must be wrong here. And uh, usually I am uh, later get confirmation of this. I think the more mm -hmm. we talk about talk about the culture as this entity uh, as this is this uh, this thing uh, then then we can lose track of what creates good culture and and I think you you, you just said it it's doing the work it's the daily environment it's it's really simple basic stuff that's what the culture comes from is this is how we prepare this is the way we do things uh not from uh from from a lot of high level talking about it or sitting in rooms with uh, mm -hmm. whiteboards mm -hmm. and uh and slogans and uh i think it's very tempting in sort of the the modern sporting context uh, uh with government funding and accountability and all of these words uh, to lose track of of how did we actually get there in the first place and i think it's no coincidence that you know when i think of you know some of the best environments in the world or or vice versa, some of them that are really struggling, I often think back to those, the, the struggling environments are, are often those Olympic training centers or the, the national mm -hmm. training centers. And you always think, well, yep. why, why is that? How, how do they have all of this, you know, all of these resources available to them, but, but they're, they're, they're failing to, to encapsulate what, what the right culture and behaviors are? Yeah, as you, as you know, uh, in, in triathlon, most of the times inside you know, the environment of one nation, uh, 
very often the program that's associated with the federation that is the program with more resources is often the program that's struggling more and uh and and picking up on on the culture aspect i think that one thing that's very important is is that i feel that it's the job of the coach to 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 see the culture but i think that it's the athletes that that take leadership leadership in creating the culture meaning that and i see that not only in my squad but in other squads where the indiv- the individual characteristics of the culture in 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 those squads uh are coming from coming from a little bit of a mix of like what how you know the the leaders in the the leaders of that culture which are the athletes uh perceive you know the seed of the culture meaning meaning that the athletes are the ones that are driving the culture forward and a lot of the times uh as a coach you can't do anything just by imposing imposing something you can't you can't just come, you just have to give them the tools so that they can interpret things and gen- assimilate it in their own in their own uh in their own language so a lot of the times for example and i see that with my squad which is you know a lot of the principles are the ethos of the squad are stuff like you know do your job hard work being patient all that stuff but then but then what for me as a coach what i take from them is their interpretation how they assimilate it and then the way they assimilate it becomes the culture of the group yeah i think i, I really like the way you put it that seeding the culture i think mm-hmm. that that's mm-hmm. what we that's what we can do i think i think you've nailed it there because the athletes and their decisions their behavior they're the ones that 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 the the strength of the culture comes from and and athletes can can come and go as they do however uh you know if you've got a strong culture then then it then it then it survives uh athletes coming and going because th- there's a way of doing things and particularly with triathlon i mean it, we we train so much so often that you know we as coaches we can't be there for every session and every, you know all the time for all of those hours mm-hmm. per week and so that yep. it's really the athletes that you know the way that they do things their how they handle themselves how they handle different situations yeah, of course we seed it, but it's but it's them that that grows that into into something strong that survives. Yeah, and and this and I feel that this and and perhaps it can talk more about this because I end up having not a very international squad, but but this also helps with with how how the squad culture impacts on 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 the athletes' own culture and their national culture. You know, uh, it's like. One of the first things that I learned when I came to the U.S. is that I was going to fail if I coached uh, if I coached my American athletes the same way that I used to coach my Portuguese athletes, and uh, and uh, and uh, and my 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 coaching changed and uh, turned into turned out that it turned into a lot less screaming and yelling, which was great, and uh, and uh, and a lot of the times, a lot of the times, if you see the culture. The, the athletes are going to assimilate it, and they're going to assimilate it on based on their own on their own culture, and and you're going to learn something from it. And and this is particularly important where when you when you coach athletes that are coming from very different backgrounds, very different nations, and 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 how you can how you can have them you know move forward and have the right mindset while you know, continuing to be, you know, South African or Spanish or Americans or wherever they come from. I mean, indeed, I mean, that that's certainly my context. It's something that I probably don't think explicitly of very much. You know, what what should I do mm-hmm. with somebody who's Spanish versus uh, uh, somebody who's American? However, uh, in practice, it is it is important. And, uh, you know, I, I'm taking on a, a couple of German athletes next year that will, will uh, come from a particular culture and they will have mm-hmm. to uh, assimilate to some degree, but also I need to understand individuals. We, you know, as coaches, we need to understand individuals as well, and you know what mm-hmm. what works for them, and uh, but also you know how do they how how are they going to fit into into the culture and and and, and thrive in it. Um, mm-hmm. So the other the other part that I think was interesting of this article was was people. 
uh, you know, the the quote of, uh, you know, people should be your, your greatest commodity. And, uh, you know, the, the part that resonated uh, with me, it was, first of all, the word commodity, uh, because I think uh -huh. that that's a way that I think, uh, you know, certainly I've noticed a, a trend of of uh, particularly federations in this case, but but organizations, sporting organizations, t treating coaching and coaches as they are commodities that can be replaced, and that it that it really doesn't matter who the coach is. Oh, the, this coach isn't working; we'll replace them with another one. And we've seen that with some squads and uh, mm -hmm. training centers that have failed is when they they haven't really understood that. Uh, and and in equally, you know, starting, for example, a training center that, you know, from from scratch, but not really understanding that the that uh, you can't just install anybody and, and that having having mm -hmm. the right people, you know, uh, is very important. And that, and that was the you know, that that was the point of, of this in the article was, uh, you know, if you you know, the uh, there was a, a quote here that says, if you have the choice to, in your budget to spend for equipment or personnel, no choice, spend it on hiring more coaches I think everybody can agree on that, but this is the mm -hmm. the, the part, uh, the the point you were making earlier about uh, nice articles that say the right things versus behavior, and and how often is this actually happening? Yeah, uh, well, but that's that's a trait of uh, that's a trait of very poor organizations, right? Because uh, let's let's look at the most uh, the most the most competitive uh, the sport in the world, which is which is football, soccer. And uh, and uh, and in in that sport, uh, nobody you know. And as much as players are very very important, uh, nobody is uh, nobody's thinking that uh, you're just going to put any coach in place, right? And uh, and uh, in that sport, uh, coaches are as much stars as as the players are. Uh, why? Because they're a big component of uh, of performance. So I would say that uh, seeing coaches as commodities where well, I'm just going to install a coach here, or I'm just going to put an ad. It's just, it's just, it's just a little counter counterproductive, right? Just the same way that you would not put an ad saying "wanted high performance athlete uh, needs to podium at Olympic Games." Uh, you're not going to put an ad saying like "wanted uh, coach," uh, you know, needs to go to the Olympic Games. So, so a lot of times. Uh, just putting random coaches in place that uh, just because, you know, they're nice guys or they have this great uh, resume with uh, that time that they coached the uh, junior team or this or that. Uh, if, if, those, uh, if those coaches are being hired and being used as commodities, uh, it's, it's going to be the organization's fault that they're, that they're hiring people like that and that they're seeing like, well, you know, this is just like an interchangeable piece I don't care if if John or Tom is coaching this uh, squad or these athletes because it's all the same. It's obviously not the same. I mean, and even the worst uh, case, which which I think we, we've seen in in the last year, with you know, is installing sort of a you know a puppet coach, if you like, of somebody that that's actually not doing the coaching, that's directed el from elsewhere, because it it violates the. The fundamental principle that that the relationship the athlete and coaches have um, mm -hmm. is so mm -hmm. important. That's where performance comes from, you know. Because if we're if we talk about performance, is is not about uh, training plans and sorry key workouts. It's about decisions that we make and understanding people and navigating that process of of improving a little bit every day. Then you can't just uh, you can't. This is not a commodity. You can't just re you know re replace somebody uh, at at will. And 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 the athletes find that out very quickly. And and I think that's what we've seen in certain circumstances where there was somebody that really wasn't the right person. They were installed because it was convenient. And 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 really the athletes quickly found out that that this wasn't the situation they wanted to be in. And uh, you know they left. Yeah, but but quote unquote puppet coaching, which is, which might be a phrase that we that I might use in the future, uh, puppet coaching is is great for everyone involved because uh, it dilutes accountability and when and with diluted accountability comes keeping your job, which which is which is uh, the goal f for most of these people that uh, that work for poor organizations where their main goal is uh, is not winning is keeping their job. I think that that's that's a whole other uh, podcast right there. So the the final uh, point point in this article in the last few minutes here was 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 uh, philosophy, 
and uh, mm-hmm. I know you have you have an opinion about this uh, as you do uh, most things. And I mean, uh, most most coaches, of course, you know, when you if if you're doing some sort of ed- coach education, you're you're tasked with coming up with a philosophy. You, you've got to have one, and uh, you, usually you're supposed to write it down on a piece of paper, and you you probably never look at it again, uh, or 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 think about it. Uh, but um, I think you're you're coming to me. Uh, oh, right. So we've got to we've got to have a philosophy now. Uh, yeah, I've I I might have a, I might have a, a blog someplace on the intertubes about uh, railing against philosophy, and it's probably very old by now. But uh, but uh, but I I prefer to I prefer to talk about practice and not philosophy. What, what is your practice? What what do you do? Because a lot of people. You know, it's really, I can sit on the couch now and write down uh, three topics or a page of topics, and this is my philosophy. But, but, if, what, but if it doesn't have any connection uh, to your practice, or if it's a to-do list, kind of like, you know, I'm a big procrastinator, so I'm, I know what I'm talking about here, which is, oh, I'm going to have a, pro, uh, I'm going to write down a philosophy, and, I'm go- and then I'm going to implement, and, and then uh, if you're not successful at implementing that, or if it's something that's so from the outside that uh, that is foreign uh, foreign to you, then it's not going it's not going to work. So so more important than your philosophy is uh, what uh, what's what's your practice? What are you doing every day? And and a lot of the times, if you ask someone like what's your practice, you're probably going to have you're going to have questions about it. Just like do you think that's a good practice or a bad practice? But I like to prefer. I prefer always to talk about practice and less about philosophy. No, well, I think I think that's that's an excellent point. I mean, philosophy is just, is just words. Uh, what, what what's your behaviors? It's that that uh, that you, what do you actually do? And uh, mm-hmm. you know, and I think I think uh, that, that's a very very good point of turning it into action. And and uh, I mean, that, that's the way that I think about it as well. I, you know, nobody walks around. And certainly, I don't thinking. Oh, what's my philosophy? Of, is is my you know. <laughs> It might be inconsistent with what I wrote on that piece of paper uh, ten years ago, or, or whatnot. It, it's it's what am I doing every day? What is this? You know, the, the, I suppose there needs to be some connection. Is this consistent? However, it is about action and what what you actually do. And you know that there was one uh, uh, comment. Uh, I think it was probably from from the All Blacks, uh, which which is uh, interesting in the context of the Rugby World Cup going on. But um, and this comes to taking philosophy to um, you know to to behaviors and the quote was uh, for a sports team littered with superstars there is a humility a dedication to hard work to doing what needs to be done ego has to be left at the door there's a rigidly enforced no dickhead policy in the squad and uh, <clears throat> I made a tweet about this because this resonated with me um, that you know when when certainly when my my squad coaching years or my national team coaching years the the uh, the greatest regrets I had with regard to philosophy right down to behaviors was when I tolerated sort of dickhead behavior and uh, and that that's an example of um, you know what is your day to day what what you know I suppose uh, you know if you if you tolerate something has that become part of your beliefs and uh, you know I think in in the challenges of real coaching of 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 real high performance. Sometimes you're faced with with no choice in these situations when you're on national teams. No choice as far as having the athlete involved. However, uh, you know teams that want to win. You and have athletes that you quote unquote need. Then 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 uh, you know perhaps it's it's more nuanced than that. However, as I said, I you know the the situations that I regret the most is when I tolerated uh, behavior in the day to day environment. Uh, perhaps at the cost of a uh, high performer, but but it had a negative impact on uh, the, our environment for the other athletes and <laughs> tying back into words like culture and beliefs, uh, you know, the, where, where the impact was felt was in, in the day to day, in our behaviors. What, what are we actually implementing? What are we doing? How do we behave? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the... One, one, one thing that popped into my mind when, when, when I was reading that part about, about the, the All Blacks is, is how much, how much uh, is, how much is the culture of that team a product of the culture of the New Zealand culture, you know, which, which, uh, and I would say that's, it's a big part of the, the big part of the, big part of the, of the culture is, is the, the way, you know, You've interacted even probably more with New Zealanders, and you kind of like know, you know, the national, 
the national culture that they have. And I think it's a little more reflected on, on, on the way the rugby team, uh, uh, behaves or, or operates, uh, tying it up with what we were talking before. I was just thinking like how, if we want to implement the all black attitude into a squad of, uh, internationals or Americans or Spanish or whatever, how, how, uh, how successful can we be? And, and I would say maybe not very successful, uh, because, because the people that we're working with are not New Zealanders, you know? And, and again, I would, I would, I would, uh, I would think about like my personal experience when, you know, when coming, when, uh, when coming to the, to the U S and working with mainly American athletes is that, uh, a lot of, a lot of, you, you really need to think about what, what makes these guys and these women uh, tick and, and, and the way they think and the way they've been going about uh, solving problems all their life and, uh, and how we can use that, that kind of mindset to make them better and make them better athletes. Uh, so, so like when I, when I, when I was reading about like, Oh, look at the all blacks they are they're pretty amazing. And they act like this or act like that. I, my first thought was, well, it's going to be pretty hard to uh, to have uh, Americans acting like New Zealanders. Very good points. So I'll see if I can find that uh, ancient philosophy article that uh, or blog that uh, that you've written. Uh, I think it might be on the triathlon book. So go have a look. Yeah, let's later. see. Let's see. Let's see if uh, I'm uh, I can be faster at deleting it than you at finding it. <laughs> right. So. Uh, so analysis, uh, there was some races uh, on the weekend. Uh, you know, to be honest, there, there's so many Ironman and 70.3 races. I don't think there's anything notable to, to talk about. Do you, do you have any comments on, on that before moving into the, uh, the the ITU end of season or the Olympic rankings? Uh, not really. Uh, sometimes uh, I follow Ironman live uh, on Twitter and sometimes uh, some, uh, some of the more... Uh, uh, meaningless races. I I might turn it off for the day and then turn it on again, and uh, and uh, kind of like races after Kona are always a little uh, a little uh, spotty in terms of uh, of fields. I was a little surprised to see that uh, there were so many quote unquote pros racing uh, Ironman seventy point three Miami, which was uh, which was. Uh, Kind of like a little bit of product of the system of uh, too many pros, and uh, and um, yeah, that was pretty much it. Yeah. I had uh, I had a few athletes racing; they were okay. Yeah, not not a lot of not a lot of thoughts regarding those races. I mean, we'll we'll see who's going to do uh, any full races uh, coming up with with Arizona and, and a couple of others uh, in attempt to gain some points for next year. Yeah, for sure. That's. Uh, it seems to be popular to uh, to do uh, to do an Ironman when you're totally burnt out from the season, just because, and that's a function of the the point system that uh, that uh, that forces you to to race at this point of the year. Taking one of the 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 worst aspects of the ITU ranking system and applied it to Ironman. Great. Yes. Absolutely. So that was also the end of the the ITU season. The last couple of weeks, there was uh, the final World World Cup in in Korea. I don't know if there was any surprises mm-hmm. there from from your point of view. Uh, it was it was just like the the last opportunities for uh, for those athletes that are in the bubble to to make the Olympics to uh, to get some really good uh, some really good points, and uh, and end of the season races are also great opportunity to uh seek redemption if you didn't have a good season and uh i didn't i didn't there were not like uh big uh big surprises uh at at world cups usually you kind of like know you know there's going to be 10 to 15 guys or 5 to 10 women that are going to have a shot at the at the podium and uh and then pretty much like the day decides uh the day decides uh, who, who's going to be who's going to be better on the day, and um, I, I don't think there were like big uh, big surprises in the in the results uh, in Alanya, in the men's side. Uh, 
the winner was a little bit obvious. Juan Pereira was, you know, the best athlete at the start, and he was the best start, the best athlete at the at the finish line. And uh, but pretty much like the other races were more competitive inside a a small group of athletes, and uh, the best athlete in the day uh, ended up winning. And then finally, the the last uh, Olympic rankings of the year uh, were were posted um, by the ITU uh, maybe yesterday or today. Surprises there, comments there. Um, only only interesting comment that I that I saw was that uh, I saw that uh, the the Canadian the Canadian women are at uh, at the back end of uh, of losing the the three slots uh, for for Canada, but. Uh, but they don't have a lot of competition from from behind. Uh, it uh, it seems that uh, countries like uh, Mexico or uh, France uh, are just they just don't have it together to uh, to pressure Canada. And uh, it looks like the three Canadian women might uh, just uh, back their way into the Olympics. I mean, it looks you know one of the examples you know France. Uh, I think uh, Emmy uh, Shreiran is uh, in the new country flag uh, at the moment. Uh, or no, maybe it's not. It's Audrey Merle. No, Audrey Merle. Uh, yeah, Aster, yeah. Uh, which uh, which is something for for a big country like France to to just be squeaking in with the the new the new uh, European flag. Uh, I mean, that we, we won't go into the the nuances of Olympic uh, qualification, but. Uh, but but they're you know the the, the rankings and and the, determine basically the number of uh, places uh, per country and we currently have four countries that have the maximum uh, three and three uh, three men three women and that's Australia Great Britain Germany and U S and then uh, the way that the IT sort of ranks uh, you know then the next group is the is the countries that have five athletes out of six and then four and and, and et cetera so. Um, so that can all be be searched, but you know, uh, it may be a point that um, uh, Lisa Norden still doesn't have uh, her her uh, slot, if you like, uh, being kind of the mm-hmm. primary athlete, so Olympic uh, silver medalist, still chasing points. She's had a, a struggle for the last uh, couple of years. Has has uh, been racing the the, the World Cups, but uh, didn't see her name on the list, and then look further down, and and you see that uh, she's she's not put herself into qualifying, which I'm sure she will do next year, but. Uh, it's not not the ideal situation. Yeah, it looks like that. Uh, looks like that. Uh, that uh, new flag for Europe. Uh, there, there's a lot of competition for that slot, and uh, and uh, and uh, you know, for, for for Lisa Norden, I think that the the key point here is for her to be to be healthy, and if she's healthy and racing, she she won't have any issue uh, uh, qualifying. Indeed. So we'll be looking. Uh... Uh, as athletes are planning for for next year of, of of how many races they have left, I believe they have eight eight left uh, that can count uh, prior to the Olympic qualifying done, uh, and we'll see uh, the, the chase continue. Yeah, yeah. So so wrapping up, uh, put the the link uh, la- uh, last time to to a few notes. Uh, and I will I will uh, see if I can find that uh, Wilshire video. See if I can find the uh, the the Polo Souza uh, philosophy document. And okay. uh, if uh, uh, and how to follow uh, follow you on Twitter and follow myself. And if anyone wants to submit uh, questions, podcast at joefilial dot com. Uh, we'll get the uh, iTunes link as soon as they uh, they get around to reviewing our podcast. Uh, we're probably going to have to be on the explicit uh, list now, but that was probably inevitable. Uh, oh, because of the no dickhead policy, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> Till next time. Okay, see ya.